Hello everyone, and welcome to the Reuse Company webinar. My name is Elena Gallego, and I'll be host today's webinar. We have with us Mr. Jose Fuentes. He will introduce us how poor quality requirements can impact our projects and which first steps can we follow to improve the quality of our requirements. The webinar will last for one hour, and during the last 15 minutes, the presenter will answer all the questions you may have. We kindly ask you to write any question during the WebEx in the private chat to the reuse company, and we will collect them for the last part of the webinar. If you have any issues to, to listen to us, don't hesitate to, to write to our chat to the reuse company as well. Now, let me briefly say some words about the reuse company. Before, um, although before, uh, let me explain to you that for today's webinar, we'll have first the description of the company. Then I will introduce you to Jose, who will explain us about the impact of poor quality requirements and will give us some tips to improve the quality of our requirements as well. For the last part of the webinar, we will see about different tools to automate the writing and the quality analysis for for the requirements according to those tips that Jose will give us. Finally, we'll have some minutes to discuss and to answer the questions that you may have. So now, let me first talk a little bit about the Reuse Company. We are an organization that has almost 20 years old now, and all the people who is involved in the company is either system or software engineers. In, which makes a good combination to understand the different challenges that we have to face with requirements. Our headquarters are in Madrid, but we also have some international offices in London and Stockholm for the Scandinavian countries. Our main vision or our main goals are around offering knowledge-centric solutions that will leverage um, systems engineering activities. The reuse company, or TRC, stands for the three main pillars that drive our technology and our solutions. The T for traceability, R for reusability and retrieval, and Q instead of C in Spanish for quality. But Something that is really in our DNA is the research. That's probably one of the reasons why our products are very advanced or ahead of the competition in terms of um, capabilities and the different technology solutions that we provide. We participate in several research European projects in the past in about requirements engineering. Currently, we are also in model base and product lines related projects. And in the future, we have several new projects that will also bring some new challenges and some new strengths to the tools that we have right now. Just to, to briefly present who is using our technology, the main domains of application are aerospace and defense, energy, as well as many other industries, as automation, healthcare, railway, and so on and so forth. And now, let me introduce you the invite presenter a little bit more in detail as well. Jose is the Chief Operating Officer at the British Company. However, he has many other responsibilities, and among those, for over five years, Jose, Jose has been the Product Manager of the former Requirements Quality Analyzer to or verification studio, as we know it today, with its, its new features. Moreover, Mr. Jose Fuentes is in COSE CSCP, Certified Systems Engineering Professional, and member of the board of AEIES, the Spanish chapter of INCOSI. And within this INCOSI board, he is also an active contributor to the INCOSI Guide for Writing Requirements. So, Thank you very much for your participation, and we hope it will be of interest to you. Thank you very much also to Jose for the presentation, 
And let's start then with the first step to improve the quality of your requirements webinar. Thank you, Elena. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this webinar. Uh, so I'll start uh, introducing what is the uh, impact uh, of uh, poor quality requirements. Uh, let me start with this uh, impacting uh, picture. Uh, fortunately, this is just uh, fiction. However, uh, in the real world, uh, we have some, uh, some uh, sometimes we find that uh, this is not uh, fiction and this is real, like in the Schiaparelli under uh, Plan to be to be landing uh, on Mars and eventually crashing on Mars and many other uh, projects. Uh, I don't know why Mars is always uh, uh, so so difficult to be landed, but uh, we have uh, many different uh, cases of, of um, uh, bad projects or bad uh, outcomes in our projects uh, uh, in Mars and uh, other uh, missions as well. Uh, mainly because, uh, because of uh, lack of consistency in our requirements, like uh, in the previous example, I will come back to this example later, or uh, other examples in the railway industry, in the avionics uh, industry, uh, naval uh, industry. So I don't want to, to, to go deeper in this because I do think that uh, most of you already know uh, this, uh, these cases. And uh, uh, just let me focus on, uh, on what is the, the impact and, uh, and uh, what what is the main source or main, the root cause of these, uh, of these problems. Uh, many times uh, all these failures are hidden behind uh, what uh, is called in the report uh, software issues. However, we all know that uh, most of the cases the, the root cause is uh, just lack of uh, uh, clearness, clearness or consistency in our requirements. So this, uh, uh, this root uh, cause can be twofold. Uh, these issues in the requirements can be twofold. Uh, on the one hand, we could find uh, wrong engineering decisions, uh, while uh, in, other case, in other cases, what we find is uh, miscommunication and ambiguous requirements. So the, the, the point is that uh, no, no matter what is this root cause, uh, the impact is huge. Uh, this impact could be money, could be time to market, could be lack of quality, customer satisfaction, and some of the times it could be uh, even um, uh, loss of uh, human life. So, it is very important, of course, to reduce as much as possible uh, this impact, and it is very important, of course, to, to fix this issue with our requirements. And uh, in our uh, point of view, from our point of view, the, um, how to fix this is, is just by following the adequate uh, set of tips uh, to write requirements. First, to reduce miscommunications be between all the stakeholders involved in the activity from, uh, from the early stages of our projects to the end of our projects. Then, of course, to streamline the writing of textual requirements and thus uh, increasing the time for the engineers to study what uh, should be the, the proper engineering decisions uh, to be taken in the projects. Uh, then, of course, to ease the detection of wrong engineering decisions, uh, uh, hopefully with the help of uh, automatic tools, as uh, I will try to show you during the demo, live demo today. And, of course, even to detect those uh, issues automatically in real time uh, on top of the um, requirements engineering tools that uh, these engineers are using to write the requirements. So why it is so important uh, to, to address these uh, issues as soon as possible? Uh, I do think that uh, most of you already know this uh, chart. But this is part of the Incuse Handbook version 4, where you can find that uh, when you mm, introduce a defect in your system in the early stages of, your, of the system, if you don't uh, detect and fix this issue until the later stages, the cost of uh, fixing this issue could be, could be very high. Uh, but uh, I like to understand this chart, not because of this arrow here, but rather because of this. So uh, probably at the very beginning of the project, you have uh, only uh, wasted 80% uh, of the budget. However, because of the decisions that uh, you are taking in this requirements stage, uh, the, uh, you have committed 70% uh, of the budget just because of the uh, issues or decisions you have taken in the, in the documents, right? Here I also like uh, this uh, chart uh, pretty much because uh, it is describing um, the different stages in, your, in the development of your, of your uh, systems and products, and it is telling us that uh, up to 70% of the defects uh, are introduced during this uh, requirements phase. However, only 4% of these uh, issues are detected and fixed uh, in these uh, earlier stages of the system. So uh, what is our um, uh, goal today is to somehow try to close this gap and reduce these, uh, 
these numbers. On the one hand, we all know that uh, defects uh, are, um, so we are all humans and we can all make defects. So it is clear that we cannot reduce this uh, red line until uh, down to zero. But of course, uh, what uh, we can do, and this is uh, something that we can do and we must do, is we can raise the green uh, arrow just to be very close to the, to the red one, right? So this is the goal of uh, today's webinar. Uh, first, uh, by means of a uh, number of, of uh, tips that uh, I will provide you in the webinar, and later in the uh, uh, live demo, uh, I will try to show you how we can uh, deal with that in an automatic way. So let's uh, go to, this, uh, to these uh, quick tips to improve the quality of your requirements. Um, we will be speaking about text requirements. This is something that uh, has to be clear from the very beginning. And uh, uh, one might uh, think, uh, okay, I learned how to write and how to read uh, when I was attending primary school, so I don't need any, any tool to, to help me write in better requirements. Uh, in the end, uh, writing and, uh, and reading is easy, uh, but uh, sometimes we can find issues, as my friend here. Uh, his wife uh, told him to put the pie in the oven at uh, 120 degrees, and I'm not uh, fully sure if uh, he succeeded in, in this endeavor to to prepare the dinner. So probably uh, he and his wife, uh, they are not uh, uh, happy today, right? So let me uh, try to, to go a little bit more serious to what could be a set of different quality characteristics to, to measure in our requirements. Uh, we can find a larger number of, of uh, quality characteristics in the standards, uh, uh, starting with the IEEE 830 with the, the classical and, and mythical correctness, ambiguity, completeness, consistency, and so on and so forth. So this is a typical uh, rules that uh, we all know. Uh, you can find uh, different or similar, sorry, similar uh, quality characteristics uh, in different standards like uh, ISO 29148 or the uh, ECSS uh, EST followed by uh, the European Space Agency and all the uh, space uh, uh, industry in Europe, and uh, uh, but uh, these all these quality characteristics, as I mentioned, are, are pretty much uh, similar to the ones in the in the IEEE standard, right? And uh, today we are living in a world where everything is smart. We are all uh, using smartphones or smart uh, wearables, uh, smart devices, smart cars, smart cities. Everything is smart. So why not uh, having a smart uh, requirements? I I like uh, this one very much. This is not, of course, this is not a requirement, but uh, this. Uh, this was a goal, and in my opinion, this is a very smart goal. It was specific, measurable, uh, aligned with the strategy of, of a nation, uh, relevant and, and time-bound, uh, let's say. So to me, this is a very uh, good example of a smart requirement. However, when I think of, of the quality characteristics that uh, I can find in the standards, uh, and just uh, let me give you a clear example of that, uh, this is uh, this is a small fragment of the ECSS standard for to describe quality characteristics for our requirements. Uh, if you uh, if you try to read this uh, definition for ambiguity, for instance, uh, the definition is that technical requirements shall, shall be unambiguous, or for uniqueness, each technical requirement shall be unique. So what I find here is that uh, this uh, statement is, of course, it is uh, clear, but it is uh, very far from being specific and, and measurable. So we uh, all need and deserve uh, something a little bit more, uh, a little bit uh, smarter, and uh, not uh, this very high level quality characteristics that uh, we find in the standard. So this makes us um, the need of uh, distinguishing between uh, quality characteristics, all of them very nice to have, but uh, very high level and difficult to be uh, measured uh, and uh, far from being specific. These are quality characteristics. And what we all need, uh, especially if we want to have some sort of autom automatic uh, measurement of the quality of our requirements, is we have to go down to quality metrics that uh, could be specific, measurable, and so on and so forth, right? So this is what we find uh, from uh, almost 20 years in, in uh, or for more than 20 years now in, in different uh, papers and books and everything that uh, is, uh, all of these are available for you. So I, uh, I encourage you to, to look for this uh, information in the, uh, in the web. And uh, of course, uh, now we, we are following, of course, a kind of evolution of uh, all these uh, quality methods and quality characteristics that we found uh, in this kind of uh, literature and, and standards. And we have um, uh, come up with a large list of different metrics that we like to classify in three main dimensions. Uh, while we analyze uh, correctness for individual requirements, one after the other, 
we uh, can also analyze completeness and consistency, in this case, for set of requirements. So we take uh, complete documents or even uh, a complete project uh, just to, to check uh, whether or not this project is consistent or the requirements within this project are consistent with, uh, uh, among themselves and consistent with models. This is another important key point here. And uh, we, all, uh, uh, we also want uh, to, to check uh, whether or not our requirements are complete. And this is uh, by far the most uh, challenging topic here. In this endeavor, we like uh, to, uh, we are based on the uh, rules uh, on the INCOSE guide for writing requirements. But of course, uh, our recommendation always is that uh, these uh, 40 rules are very nice, but uh, most of the times they need to be tailored to the specific needs of our, our different uh, customers and users, right? And um, uh, let me uh, now start with this uh, summary of different uh, tips that uh, are just our recommendation for you to write uh, better requirements. So I will, uh, I will describe here 12 uh, different tips. I hope uh, you like it, or I hope uh, take it uh, as a gift uh, just uh, for you to take the ones that you are com uh, comfortable with and uh, to remove from the screen, if you wish, the ones that uh, you probably you feel that probably in your industry or according to the level of maturity of your company are not uh, fitting well, right? So let me start uh, with, uh, with uh, tip number one, keep your requirements short and precise. Avoiding uh, um, um, the, the need of, of uh, having different uh, needs in the, in the same uh, requirement, in the same uh, text, or avoiding comments, uh, rational assumptions uh, within the body of the requirements. Probably you will be needing uh, different attributes uh, uh, for these rational or, or additional comments. Uh, avoiding uh, expressions uh, that uh, don't uh, convey any, any meaning, such as the system shall be capable of doing something. So probably it is better just to say the system shall, the typical requirement with the system shall. Um, please uh, mind also punctu punctuation, readability, because uh, uh, all of these are key to have uh, uh, consistent, uh, sorry, a precise and, and short uh, requirement. Of course, uh, uh, connectors uh, such as and and or could be making your requirement uh, uh, longer than, uh, than needed. So um, tip number two is uh, be consistent with the shall, should, will, must, uh, you name it, whatever. So uh, um, we have uh, some of our customers decided to, to use only shall, other are using shall, should, will, but uh, whatever you decide to use, uh, agree on, on what is the actual meaning of uh, all these uh, uh, modal verbs and uh, be consistent with the uh, use of these, uh, of these modal verbs, right? So it is, uh, it is uh, key to know what are the differences. Sometimes uh, these differences are very, very subtle, but uh, it is uh, always needed to be aware of these differences. And of course, uh, many times uh, uh, it is uh, better than uh, changing between different uh, uh, modal verbs. It is better to have or to add an additional uh, attribute, it's, uh, say, priority attribute, for instance, uh, in your requirements management system so that you can always keep a uh, shall, for instance, and you can change uh, between the different levels of priority just by changing uh, an attribute. So third rule is uh, atomicity, one action per requirement. So it is clear that uh, we all want uh, to avoid something like the system shall do this and this and this and this. So uh, especially after the shall, uh, we always uh, want to find uh, one single action. Um, this will make your requirements easier to be understood by all the, the stakeholders and uh, on top of uh, all, easy to be verified. When you write requirements, uh, normally you are uh, playing a particular role. You are the requirements engineer, you are the business analyst, uh, you can name different uh, roles behind. But uh, when you, or this is what I, uh, at least I try to do is when I write requirements, I try to put in the shoes of the, of the verification team, the testers, the developers, and of course, uh, my, my end customer. So this is key, uh, just to, to have atomic and uh, clear requirements. Uh, avoiding, again, uh, combinators like AND or OR, um, but uh, this AND or OR, this is uh, also another uh, a tricky point because uh, most of, of our requirements could be having uh, AND or OR keyword, but uh, normally as part of the condition and not as part of the, of the main action. So, and, and or, and uh, not, or whatever, uh, as, a, as a complex expression for the, for the condition is okay. However, uh, and, and or, for, uh, after the shall, just to express different actions uh, for, for my requirements are, of course, very harmful 
in the in the definition of matter quantum. So um, now a key point here in this atomicity is uh, identifying um, new requirements with a unique uh, ID to make uh, things easier, starting with uh, traceability, which is another key point here. And um, uh, uh, however, sometimes in the name of uh, completeness and consistency, uh, we could uh, we could choose uh, uh, instead of uh, splitting a requirement into two or three requirements, we could choose to have a kind of a table or a kind of a list of uh, bullets, right? So having having all different uh, or having a number of different uh, uh, topics here as a list of bullets or a table uh, all together in the same requirement uh, makes uh, uh, this requirement uh, easier to be to be uh, assessed for completeness and consistency. However, this is uh, contradicting the idea of atomicity, and on, on top of all, it is making uh, the verification of my requirements a little bit uh, harder. Because uh, what if my requirement is fitting with the first uh, part of the with the first uh, bullet item, but not with the second? How can you refer to this in in, in your testing phase, right? So important this trade-off, and uh, try to choose uh, wisely always between these two options. Passive voice, wow, um, what a rule or what a metric. Uh, this is one of the most uh, typical and classical rules that you can find uh, in, in, in uh, every book about uh, how to write requirements. However, uh, my definition about this passive voice is that uh, passive voice is not uh, harmful itself. To me, uh, passive voice is harmful where when um, it is representing the main action of the requirement, uh, mainly because uh, passive voice uh, um, is prone to missing the subject. And to me, all the actions in my system must have uh, with a subject, right? So when passive voice is formed uh, to represent the, um, the main action of the requirement, to me, this is, of course, very harmful. However, um, I found uh, and I use many times in my requirements documents uh, a passive voice just to express uh, to express what is the condition. The condition is uh, is uh, something that is triggered, and uh, normally this trigger could be started uh, from inside or from outside. So it doesn't matter who is triggering this condition; uh, my system has to react to it, right? So when I say that I, it doesn't matter, uh, for instance, for uh, autonomous driving. If I have to react to a wet floor and I express this uh, this uh, as a passive voice condition, it doesn't matter if it is wet because uh, it is raining, because someone is gardening or something, whatever. I don't uh, I don't need the subject. I have to react to this uh, to this uh, condition. So in the condition, um, to me, passive voice is harmless. However, for the main action, as I said, uh, passive voice is harmful. Right. Uh, be aware of negative requirements. Uh, so most of the times we have said that uh, if you can express something as, uh, as an affirmative requirement, uh, try to do so. However, not every single time we can do that. And uh, in the name of uh, clarity, uh, sometimes you will be uh, allowing uh, negative keywords in your requirements, especially uh, for, for safety requirements. So normally safety requirements are, are entitled to, to, to include the negative uh, particles. What is key is that uh, uh, at least for non-native speakers, uh, when we find uh, two or more uh, negative uh, keywords in the same requirement, of course, this is uh, uh, very difficult to, to, to be understood. So uh, when you can avoid uh, um, negative keywords in your requirements, of course, always avoid uh, uh, mixing together two, three, four different uh, negative keywords in the same requirement. But uh, however, don't try to, to get notes uh, when, when you think of this metric. And uh, if you think that the best way and the more clear way to, to represent uh, a requirement or a constraint is by using a negative requirement, please do so. Please uh, use the, the negative requirement in, in such a case. Right? Use vocabulary and acronyms consistently. Uh, it is uh, key, especially when, uh, when uh, the teams are uh, uh, scattered uh, across different uh, cities, different countries and continents. It is key to agree on, on a particular uh, number of items in a vocabulary. So please uh, use uh, the, these uh, names or, or, or elements from the vocabulary and use it in a consistent way. Uh, mind the uh, misspelling as well in, in this metric. And of course, um, it is even more important uh, when, when, uh, when we speak about acronyms. So normally, uh, at least this is my piece of advice, uh, uh, every single acronym that I use in my requirements, I try to, for this acronym to be explicitly described in a, in, a, in a glossary, in a vocabulary, or somewhere else, right? 
So you never know what uh, what uh, could be the different uh, uh, interpretations of this acronym um, across different uh, different countries, right? And of course, uh, many times this vocabulary doesn't have to to come uh, in the form of uh, let's say uh, in the form of a dictionary. It could be in the form of a model. If you already have a, a model as a reference for your requirement, this model is, is taking the, the place of uh, or is replacing the vocabulary. So, so this dictionary could be just a SysML model with a number of, uh, of uh, blocks uh, that you have already agreed, or um, uh, a simulation model with a number of signals or something like that. So please uh, uh, use this uh, uh, consist consistently. Right? Of course, uh, number seven is um, avoid uh, avoid uh, ambiguous and vague expressions. It is not only the typical ambiguous uh, adverbs like uh, quick or, or fast or the typical ambiguous adjectives like uh, user friendly. The list of uh, of uh, words that uh, or keywords that uh, are very difficult to be measured and to be understood is huge. Uh, not only adjectives and adverbs, as I said, but also actions uh, in the earth space. Uh, uh, everybody hates uh, survive because what is the meaning of uh, surviving in the space or manage? Uh, uh, what is the meaning of manage if I have to manage whatever entity or to deal with uh, an action? What does it mean? Uh, imprecise quantifiers. Uh, uh, suppose something like uh, uh, the train shall have uh, several doors or many doors or few, whatever, or sufficient uh, uh, power. So this is something that, of course, you have to avoid together with uh, uh, speculative sentences, if possible, uh, appropriate uh, absolutes. I hate absolutes, uh, all, always, never. And, uh, and remember also uh, verbs uh, ending in ice, maximize, minimize, and so on and so forth. So this is something that you have to take care of and uh, as much as uh, you can avoid in this in your requirements. Solution three, uh, focus on, on what and not the how. The requirements should not state a given solution, uh, but uh, rather they have to represent uh, what the system is intended to do. Right. Use numbers wisely. Uh, requirements, even text requirements, uh, in many cases uh, will be including uh, numbers. Uh, uh, numbers, uh, they all have to come uh, with the proper measurement unit or the proper um, quantifying of an entity. So you can speak about uh, 20 centimeters or I can speak about uh, four wheels. So never just a number without, uh, without a measurement unit or an entity behind. And of course, um, uh, sometimes uh, you have to, you will have to provide the proper tolerances, not uh, not probably for uh, every measurement unit, but uh, in most of them you will have to provide a tolerance, something like uh, uh, 80 degrees Celsius plus uh, minus 5% or something like that. So please uh, use it uh, accordingly. And of course, speaking about numbers, remember the, um, uh, one of the expressions in, in rule number seven, I hate uh, the number 100% because most of the times we cannot achieve this 100%. So something like, uh, uh, the reliability of, of a system has to, be, has to be 100% or something like that, uh, uh, or the availability is something that, of course, we all know that we cannot accomplish. So please uh, mind uh, the use of this 100%. Consistency with regards to, uh, to the requirements themselves and, and uh, with regards to, to models. So a clear example of this is, is the example that uh, I remember this picture from, uh, from, uh, from uh, NASA. So this is the clear example of a uh, of an issue uh, where different measurement units were conflicting, and that the result was uh, uh, system was crashing, right, or was not in the proper orbit just because of of, uh, you know, of an issue uh, in uh, between uh, newtons and uh, and uh, and pounds in in measuring the force, right? Uh, avoiding duplicate requirements, avoiding conflicting requirements. Uh, um, uh, remember this mission that I was mentioning, and also mind the consistency between your requirements and your and your PBS uh, uh, in in a CCML or the property allocation. If you have uh, properties in a CCML diagram and you speak about uh, the allocation of these properties in, in in the requirements, so all this has to be consistent. Well, rule number eleven. Keep in mind the level of detail. Um, uh, we all know that uh, uh, one document is not uh, all for, for our projects. Uh, in, in, in the most extreme cases, you can, uh, you can go, for instance, from uh, mission requirements to system requirements to phase requirements and so on and so forth. So you, you will be dealing with different requirements, uh, different levels of requirements. So when you write your requirement, please be consistent of that. Be, keep this in mind. And of course, uh, when you, we think of the rest of the rules to be applied to our requirements, um, uh, the rules that uh, apply perfectly, of, are fitting perfectly for, for a very uh, 
uh, low level technical specification probably will not fit at all in, in a very high level uh, mission uh, requirements document or business requirements document. So, for instance, the level of ambiguity that uh, you allow in a very high level document, of course, you can allow some room for ambiguity. But, of course, in a very technical and a very detailed technical specification, there should be no room for ambiguity. So, please uh, keep this in mind as well. And uh, finally, the last uh, uh, but not least uh, rule is, is define and follow a style guide uh, for writing review requirements, a kind of grammar, or as we call it uh, internally, uh, pattern or boilerplate or, or you, can, you name it. There are different uh, different names for that. So uh, for us, uh, this is an example of what we call a pattern. It is just uh, representing what is the structure for a well-written uh, requirement. Uh, so this is uh, typical for the 29148 uh, when a condition happens. A subject, uh, one of my system or components, uh, shall perform an action on an object within a time constraint. So something like that. So normally, uh, uh, we like uh, the approach of, of, uh, of uh, showing to our, our requirements engineers a number of different uh, patterns to be followed. But as much as we can, if we can uh, do it uh, on top of a tool, then they can, uh, they can uh, um, understand very quickly what is the intention of this pattern. And of course, uh, the pattern will help us uh, and will help engineers uh, catching uh, more information and checking consistency uh, in a real time uh, mode. Right? So uh, for us, uh, patterns are, are good to, to reduce uh, false positives. Remember the, the examples of uh, the use of passive voice or, or and or that uh, when, it, uh, when they happen in the condition, it is uh, harmless. However, if it is happening for the action, it is harmful. So with the help of patterns, we can contextualize where the different issues are occurring in our requirement. Uh, of course, with the help of patterns, we can uh, extract uh, properties from textual requirements. Once we extract these properties, we can uh, in an automatic way, we can uh, deal with, uh, with a different uh, number of um, consistency checking. We can, of course, uh, better adapt uh, overlapping and missing links uh, metrics in our tool verification studio because of the semantic uh, search engine that we provide to detect uh, duplicated requirements, for instance. And of course, on top of that, we help, as I mentioned before, we help uh, authors uh, while they write uh, requirements in, in, uh, in the requirements management tools, right? So that when they uh, try to write a new requirement, they just pick uh, the type of requirement they want to write, and a pattern will be available for them uh, putting together the structure of the requirement and the proper content and consistent content from the, from the dictionary. So all this put together is just uh, how to write uh, consist uh, consistent requirements, right? So these are my, my 12 rules. Of course, uh, you, you have your own rules, probably, and I would be very happy if you write uh, after this uh, webinar, if you can uh, text me or you can uh, mail me with, uh, with the rules that uh, you like, the ones that you don't like, because of course, as I mentioned before, uh, you can never try to, to, to adapt uh, or to, I'm not intending uh, for all these rules to be applied uh, in every single case. So to me, the most important rule is, is the common sense. So don't try to, to match or to adapt all these rules to all your requirements and documents, uh, regardless of what is the, the skill of your people, the skill of your team, regardless of the level of maturity of your company, regardless of the, the industry in your company, and so on and so forth. So please always adapt uh, this and don't think that uh, this is uh, something that you can uh, start uh, using from the very first day. And of course, these are not the, the 12 commandments that are to be applied uh, from, from tomorrow on. So I am not trying to be Cecil B. and and, and trying to, to, to force you to follow these uh, 12 rules from, from tomorrow, let's say. Right? So uh, all these rules um, uh, are pretty much uh, describing the way you have to write requirements. But uh, even if uh, the requirements that you are written could be very good requirements, they could be in conflict uh, with other requirements, or you can uh, uh, end up uh, with uh, uh, not non-complete uh, specification, right? So if this this table is coming from the CAUS report, sorry, I'm missing. I don't know why I'm missing the reference. This is. Uh, the typical information coming from the CAUS report uh, describing what, the, what are the uh, key success factors in our projects. Uh, however, as, as probably you know, the CAUS report is not only fo focusing on the success factors, but also in the failure factors. And uh, something which is uh, interesting is that uh, the issues in the failure factor uh, are not the same as the issues in, in the success factors. And what we find as a failure factor, which is the failure factor which is impacting the most uh, in our project, is completeness. To me, completeness is the most uh, challenging point here. 
So uh, I do think that it deserves some uh, words in here. Uh, I was um, presenting a webinar uh, six months ago or so uh, on, on this topic, requirements completeness. So I will I will uh, send you the link uh, to this uh, other webinar if you want to know a little bit uh, more about this. But uh, just very briefly, uh, some. Uh, uh, sources of, of uh, incomplete requirements specifications are something like uh, please uh, provide requirements uh, and or mind all the different stages uh, of, of your system when you provide the requirements so normally uh, the requirements that uh, we normally write down in our requirements documents are based or focused on the utilization uh, phase but uh, a little bit less in support and nothing about retir retirement and of course nothing about production so we all know that uh, we have to deal with requirements at uh, every different uh, stage in here right uh, similar to the stakeholders, uh, so normally, uh, we, if we think of this of this, um, of this uh, onion chart, uh, we find the, the product or the service uh, in the inner uh, block, but uh, we have the system, the containing system, especially in a system of system uh, approach, and the wider environment. You will be capable of finding uh, stakeholders at every of these four different layers. So please consider the requirements coming from uh, all the stakeholders in all these. Uh, uh, four layers. So mind or uh, take care of the different uh, stakeholders and manage uh, stakeholders at uh, all these uh, layers. More about this, uh, normally our systems are dealing with states, so please uh, uh, properly uh, deal with all the different stages uh, for your requirements. And uh, similar uh, uh, for the, what we call the, the happy path, uh, normally when when, for instance, when I approach uh, a teller machine and I want to withdraw some, some money, I write all the requirements for the good uh, case, a good uh, path, everything uh, is good. So I enter one data to the other, the PIN code of, the, of my credit card, the amount, and so on and so forth. But uh, what if something is wrong? You have to deal with requirements for this alternative or exception uh, handling um, uh, paths, right? So mine this as well. And of course, finally, uh, Functional requirements is just uh, a part of the of the job. Uh, you have to deal also with uh, the non so functional requirement. And uh, as an example, I have this table coming from the NASA uh, Systems Engineering Handbook, uh, with uh, including a taxonomy of different types of requirements. And as I mentioned, I leave you this link uh, to this uh, webinar on on um, on uh, uh, completeness. You have similar links to to in the consistency uh, slide uh, to the webinar about uh, consistency. And the same for, for the patents. I also presented a, um, a webinar on, on, on patents, right? So improving the quality. Uh, after all these uh, tips, probably you are uh, overwhelmed uh, of information, but improving the quality of your requirements is uh, at the fingertips. So it's not that hard. And uh, what I would like to show you in the practical uh, session of this webinar uh, are our tools included in the system here in suite. Uh, so for all of you that uh, already know us for a while, um, let me tell you that we have rebranded uh, some of our tools has been renamed and uh, the former requirements quality analyzer now become a verification studio with a similar capability but uh, we have extended with, with more support uh, to the verification process according to the INCOSI handbook. Uh, this is the tool that we use to set up what are the rules that uh, are to be used for, for checking of the quality of your requirements and of course this is the tool that we use for the offline quality checking of my requirements. Right? Uh, the second of the tools that uh, I will be showing you in the live demo is the authoring tool. Uh, this authoring tool is, is the tool that, that is used for the authors of the requirements just to check uh, quality in real time and just to, to follow dictionaries and patterns in a very quick and very nice uh, way instead of uh, detecting uh, issues in the requirements in a later stages, right? Uh, this webinar will not cover at all uh, Knowledge Manager, even if uh, you know that Knowledge Manager is normally the tool that uh, we use to deal with the dictionaries, and especially the tool that we use to deal with, uh, with uh, patterns, and uh, uh, nothing about traceability in this, uh, in this uh, demo, right? So let me start uh, with the um, uh, live demo. This is just uh, a video I already recorded, so let me play this, uh, this video, right? So, uh, first of all, uh, I will be using in this demo uh, uh, the latest uh, release of, of our tools that you can find in our website. This is our website, so you can visit our website to download uh, this uh, version of our tools. Of course, you can ask us for, for um, trial, free trial licenses that uh, we will be very happy 
uh, uh, giving you this trial license uh, for you to, to deal with these uh, tools. And aside of that, uh, this, uh, uh, in this uh, website, you can also find what is the, um, the, what we call the out of the box uh, database that we offer for you with a number of different, uh, with a number of different um, uh, rules already implemented. So you don't have to create your own rules. The tool is already included in the rules. And uh, uh, also in the, in the resources uh, section of this website, uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will leave there um, uh, an Excel template for you to, to write requirements in Excel. In this, uh, uh, let's say, beginner uh, demo that I prepared for today, I just focused on, on correctness, and uh, I also focused on using this in, on top of Excel instead of uh, using uh, doors or some others. Of course, you all know that uh, we also provide uh, connectors to doors, uh, uh, those next generation, uh, PTC integrity, and uh, some other requirements uh, management tools. So now what I'm doing in this video is I'm downloading uh, the English, the, the uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Access version of the English uh, set of rules. We provide uh, rules uh, in English, uh, uh, French, uh, Spanish, uh, German, uh, Swedish, and now also Italian and Japanese, even if it is not uh, as part of this video, Italian and Japanese are already covered in, in this, right? So you can download it from here, and in these other resources, you can also download the, the template that, uh, that I mentioned. So let me uh, go just uh, to, to Verification Studio. So first, uh, what I'm doing is uh, I have uh, downloaded uh, this uh, uh, default database. It is a zip file that I have uh, zipped in this folder. So I have to, to go to the System Engineering Suite server, uh, open the available connection uh, screen, and uh, create a new connection. Creating a connection. Uh, for access is pretty quick and, and easy. We also provide connections in MySQL, um, uh, SQL Server, and Oracle, right? So this is the name of, of my database, let's say. Uh, in the case of access, uh, I just uh, pick the file, the MDB file. So this is my folder. So I provide a folder, and I pick the file, right? So this is my file. Uh, the user and password in this uh, default out of the box database is empty, but uh, just please, please uh, just uh, check and remember just to avoid being asked over and over for this uh, empty login and password. And of course, uh, I'm uh, telling the tool this is the active uh, database. So now the connection to the database is ready. Uh, the database is uh, having uh, some rules, as I mentioned, and uh, patterns and dictionaries. So all this is part of the of the diction of the database. Even if the dictionary is uh, almost empty. In, uh, in this out of the box, you have to, to create uh, your own dictionary for your business domain, right? right? So this is now Verification Studio. Uh, first time you open Verification Studio, there are no connection to requirements. These are all the different tools that we can connect to. And uh, in this uh, webinar, I will be connecting to, to Microsoft Excel. So I pick uh, Excel, and uh, uh, this is the connection screen. So I give a name for my connection. And of course, I have to, to, to choose the folder and the file to be, to be connected. In the case of a connection to a requirements engineering tool, let's say doors, you, have, you will have to provide uh, your, then the server uh, address uh, and the port and your credentials and, and so on and so forth, right? In this case, Excel, there is no server. It is just a file server. But of course, uh, there is a tricky point here in the case of Excel, which is the mapping of the columns between uh, uh, the columns in your own Excel and the columns that uh, we expect uh, in the tool, right? So this is why you have to right-click and create a column mapping. This is a, this is a small uh, wizard, uh, a quick wizard, uh, that, where you have to map uh, the meaning of the different columns. If you follow the template that I was mentioning before, um, uh, this form is already filled up, right? Because uh, 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 the name is, is fitting with the name that the tool is expecting, the name of the columns, fit with the name that the tool is expecting, right? If not, you will have to click on the magnifiers and pick uh, uh, the, um, the column name from, from here, from this, uh, from this um, uh, list, right? I will advance a little bit uh, the video because this is pretty much the same. For the quality attributes, uh, the same. You have to pick uh, what are the columns where the tool will represent and, and uh, store the quality attributes. And this is just the final step uh, giving you some uh, giving you some, uh, uh, the final overview. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there were two uh, Excel sheets in this workbook. The first one is the scoreboard. It is not mapping with the column mapping. The second one is the system requirements uh, specification. This is mapping. So once uh, you finish with this uh, quick uh, wizard, 
of course, and now you can click uh, OK. And uh, uh, this EQA uh, file is created. This is just an XML file uh, uh, representing this mapping between the name of the columns and, uh, and uh, the name of the attributes that uh, the tool is expected, right? So everything is, is done for, uh, here, and I encourage you to use our template just to have it uh, uh, as easier as possible. So now uh, the, the connection is created. Double click on the connection, and uh, the tool uh, uh, now is opening and uh, is retrieving requirements from Excel. The first uh, thing you have to, to do is uh, the tool is now telling you this is the first time you connect this Excel file, and that there are no uh, rules for this uh, to analyze this uh, this document, right? So uh, in the out of the box in the out of the box database, there is only one set of rules, the ones that uh, we call TRC metric configuration. So you just pick this, and this will be the rules to be applied for your document, right? Uh, in in other scenarios, you can uh, you can end up with uh, two, three, four, twenty different uh, set of rules that you can apply for the different documents accordingly, right? So these are my um, these are my requirements. And uh, first of all, uh, let me show you what are the rules that uh, are to be applied in the, during this uh, demo. These are the the rules in the out of the box database. So you can find that the tool is offering you a large number of, of uh, metrics, but only 21 are enabled. So this is the one that are enabled in this, in this uh, out-of-the-box uh, uh, configuration. Of course, nothing about consistency, nothing about completeness. If you are interested in this, uh, please uh, check uh, the list of our webinars, and uh, there are uh, uh, webinars completely devoted to completeness and consistency. So the second is, uh, uh, this is where I link uh, um, my Excel sheet uh, to, the, to my requirements uh, uh, metrics. This is already done, but I have just changed a little, changed a little bit the configuration, especially just to say to, to tell the tool I want uh, the tool to save the results of the quality assessment, not only in our side but also in, in, in Excel. And now these are my something like 50 requirements, and I can analyze these requirements in a very quick way. So analyzing just correctness is very quick. And you can analyze 50 requirements in, in a couple of seconds maximum, right? So the result is, is this additional column with a three, two, one star. Uh, of course, three is high quality, uh, two is uh, something is, is wrong, and uh, one is uh, something is uh, you have to fix uh, this issue, right? So this is poor quality for this requirement. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, why this requirement was uh, and rank uh, or, or rate as, as low quality is because of this. You just hover the mouse uh, on this uh, star, and then you can see that uh, there is a passive voice, there is a vague adjective, and so on and so forth. Of course, you can double click uh, on your requirement, and uh, uh, the tool will uh, now show you a little bit more detail. So, this is my requirement, and these are the four issues that were detected. Just uh, click on the issues, and the issue will be highlighted in the text, right? So that you can very quickly um, uh, fix this issue. And of course, if you have a right to to save this result in your in your requirements repository, you can from Verification Studio you can fix the issue and save. Right? Verification Studio is normally the tool not for the people who actually write the requirements, but rather uh, for the people who wants to control the overall quality of your requirements. So we can, we are showing uh, a different reports and different charting. And of course, we can also show the evolution of the quality uh, along the, the timeline. And this is uh, why I have taken the first snapshot, just to say, OK, I want the first snapshot of this information. Uh, this information that you can see here about uh, just about, about correctness. As you can see, the consistency and the completeness chart are gray. This is meaning there are no rules for that. But the rest has been now represented in this snapshot. So that when I take uh, the other snapshots uh, after that, uh, I would be capable of checking how was the evolution. I can also uh, see uh, this different view. I like this view, by the way. This is not uh, showing the requirements, but rather it is showing the 21 metrics available for my document. So I can uh, just uh, sort uh, these columns just to, um, just to uh, focus on the, what is the most challenging topic, what is the least uh, uh, challenging topics, and so on. So I open this. This is just the imprecise quantifiers. So I can see that uh, these are the, all the quantifiers that I have been, the imprecise quantifiers that I have been using. The most challenging is many that appears two times. And I can just double click, and then these are the requirements, including many in my specification. This is a very quick way to fix the, this issue. Because now I open, I click, uh, and then I say, wow, this requirement is using many and also as possible. So probably all these two uh, has to be, to be fixed. Of course, the tool allows you to fix. 
uh, when you fix it, uh, the tool will be showing you a green frame and not a red frame, just to say that everything is correct now, right? Okay, so um, I think that uh, uh, that's all from uh, from the verification studio. Well, yes, uh, uh, of course you can create your own report. We have uh, different types of reports. Uh, some are more uh, summary uh, oriented, uh, some others are more thorough, uh, and you can even create your own report uh, uh, in a very quick way so that uh, the report could be containing exactly what you want. Remember that uh, uh, you can uh, even store the results of the quality checking in, uh, in your requirements uh, repository, in this case in Excel. If you were using uh, doors, you can, if you want, the tool, can, the tool can create additional attributes in doors just to represent uh, these quality levels. And of course, once this attribute is represented in doors as a, door, as a regular doors uh, attribute, of course, you can involve this in your own reporting doors, right? So let me uh, close Verification Studio and show you the second of the tools, uh, the authoring tool. The authoring tool is a, is a plugin on top of uh, on top of um, on top of your requirements management tool. In this case, as I mentioned, it is Excel. So this is Excel. Once I have already analyzed uh, the quality uh, in the in the previous tool in Verification Studio, this is why I have uh, this column H with uh, the color uh, uh, high, medium, low representing uh, the level of quality of my requirements. And of course, I also have the quality summary, the, sorry, the, the quality summary column, yes, uh, K in this case, uh, showing you exactly the same information as was shown uh, in Verification Studio, just uh, for you to have a tip on how to improve the quality of these requirements, right? So very quickly, let me show you just uh, uh, how to improve the quality of a couple of requirements. Uh, this is another, uh, the, the other, uh, Excel sheet that I mentioned, just a, a kind of a reporting a sheet, uh, including the level of quality of my requirements, uh, along with uh, all the information. So let me just focus on, on the quality of the requirements. So I, I pick one of my requirements, of course, one of the requirements that has been rated as, um, as poor quality. And uh, uh, if you install the, the RAT uh, plugin, you will have this menu, requirements quality menu with uh, these uh, many options. Uh, so you can click on, on authoring so that uh, now the same screen as I was showing you before in the other tool will appear just to highlight what are the issues in your requirement and of course uh, giving you the chance to, to fix that. So I can see uh, passive voice, you click and then passive voice is highlighted, uh, vague adverbs, you click and the vague uh, adverb is highlighted and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, uh, this, is, this appointment is ranked as, uh, as uh, low quality. This is the, these are the 21 rules. And of course, uh, now you are on top of Excel, so of course you can, uh, you can uh, improve the quality. This requirement is so awful that I prefer to start from scratch. So I remove the text, and then I still see that uh, there is a red frame. So this requirement is poor quality. I didn't make any mistake yet, but uh, this requirement is, is breaking three rules. There is no imperative uh, mode, there is no shall, let's say. There is no action, and it is too short, right? So as soon as I start typing in real time, the tool is, is uh, checking the quality over and over in real time. Just to say that uh, uh, the train shall reach a speed of uh, 300 kilometers per hour is a good requirement. When I write the, the backslash, then the tool is, is complaining about this backslash. This is another rule that I have implemented. But as soon as I finish with the H, the tool understands that uh, this is not uh, to say A backslash B or action A backslash action B. It is just a uh, measurement unit, uh, kilometers per hour. So it is uh, high quality. Then uh, the green frame me okay now you can you can save of course you can save even with uh, poor quality but it is better if, of course if you save with uh, high quality so now the requirement is there and the column H is representing high quality for this uh, for this requirement let me briefly uh, show you another another requirement and, and uh, what is the main issue in this uh, in the second requirement so I scroll down and then I open this uh, rank as medium quality but uh, with a very particular issue in here and uh, the issue is is uh, misspelling as I mentioned before, uh, when you install our out-of-the-box database, uh, this database is including a lot uh, of, of the, or a large number of, of uh, names and common names in, in English, but of course it is lacking all the uh, domain-specific information. So VAC is not part of this dictionary. And of course you might think that uh, this requirement is okay. So there's nothing wrong with this, uh, with this uh, requirement, but the tool is, is telling you, okay, something is wrong. 
So what you can do from here is to start uh, a communication mechanism between you, the requirements engineer, and the rest of participants in, in this uh, quality assessment uh, team. So first of all, uh, by means of this screen, I'm communicating with the owner of the dictionary, and I'm telling him, please uh, consider to add uh, VAC as part of the vocabulary, just to avoid that uh, once it is part of the vocabulary, it, it will be no longer detected as uh, misspelling. Right? And of course, uh, uh, this is just uh, giving a suggestion and not uh, adding it directly to the dictionary. So I still have to, to speak to the, to the quality manager and say, okay, please, uh, the quality of this comment is medium, but I do think that it should be high. And the only issue is this. So you can communicate from this tool with this uh, guy, just uh, telling him, okay, I want to have uh, high quality because of this and this and this and this. You can describe what is your issue. And if you accept that uh, this recommendation will be sent uh, to, this, to this team. Let me uh, don't uh, post uh, this uh, recommendation just to have it uh, quicker in the video. And then my last uh, action point here is, is to show you how to write a new requirement. So if you go to an empty row and click on the same button, offering, what you have is an empty uh, new requirement. Uh, aside of the level of quality, here on the right-hand side, you can see that I can enable from the top menu the writing assistance. And uh, when I click on the writing assistance, uh, I can uh, first I can uh, open this list, uh, including the, the number of different uh, uh, types of requirements that are uh, available for this particular document. This is something that uh, you can uh, customize in the verification studio. You can say, okay, for this document, I want uh, to use this and this and this and these types of requirements. So when you pick one of these types of, the, of, of requirement, in the second of the list, uh, you will find one or many different patterns. In this case, only one. This is, this is the pattern, as uh, the database out of the box is including a, a small number of patterns that you can customize and grow later. So the, the pattern is just showing you the name, the description, some examples of other requirements following this pattern. And of course, in, in color boxes here, you can find what are the key blocks uh, uh, to conform a, a well-written requirement following this, in this grammar. So I have to provide the name of a physical characteristic and provide in blue, the blue uh, and green box, and also in red, I have to provide the name of, of, uh, of a system element, right? So I start, I start typing, and as you can see, there are some uh, items coming from the dictionary. So this capacity, frequency, length, mass, power, and so on are coming from the dictionary. So these are the elements in the dictionary fitting with this particular um, uh, nature of this block, which is a uh, um, uh, measurement unit. So I write the length of the... Now, uh, there are no component or system name uh, already in the dictionary, just the word component and the word uh, system, so I can pick one of these. If you fill up uh, the list of, of uh, component name or you connect to your model uh, with uh, having blocks in CCML or something similar, you will find that this list is, is huge or, or contains as, much, uh, uh, as many elements as you need, right? So in this case, uh, I just pick a component, the length of, my, of the components at B, and then a number, and now the two main units coming from the dictionary. As soon as you finish this, you find that there is another green frame uh, around my, my requirements in the left-hand side of the tool, meaning this uh, text, this requirement is fitting with this uh, pattern, right? Uh, along with the second uh, green box, it is meaning, wow, this requirement is, is pretty good. So I have to be happy with this requirement. And then, of course, I just uh, save and close, and then my new requirement will appear in my requirements management system, in Excel, in this case. So now I can uh, go back to Verification Studio. I can attend uh, the suggestion from this guy to, to improve the quality manual. And this is what I am doing here. I have changed uh, manually the, the quality for this requirement. This is why now I, this requirement has three star, but the three star are black, meaning this is manual assessment, as you can see in the seal here. And uh, this is also meaning that from this moment on, whatever, um, whatever um, uh, charting or report that uh, you generate will consider that uh, the level of quality for this requirement is high quality, right? So I will show you how I just create my second snapshot. And you will find how after the requirements that I have fixed and this manual assessment and the new requirement that I have created uh, uh, having uh, high quality, you can see how the green uh, area of this uh, chart is, is growing now, right? So uh, that's all from my side. Uh, now uh, Elena will uh, end up with the, with the webinar. So Elena, please. 
Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, it's been very interesting to see all the different tips and rules about how can we improve our requirements. Um, and it's um, it's also very nice that infography that you've done with all the set of rules, just to print that out and put it on our desk, just to have it as a guideline. So thank you. Uh, we have some questions now from from the participants. So I will start with with them. Um, Jose, uh, um, a participant asked, some of my requirements quality rules are unique to my company. So how can I use them for the automatic assessment? Yeah, this is a very good question. And, uh, I have heard this question many times in all my customers. So um, uh, the out-of-the-box database that we offer in uh, uh, free of charge from our website uh, is just including these 21 uh, rules that uh, I was showing you before. However, of course, as I, as, as I mentioned, normally uh, these, rules, these rules could not be applied to every single uh, company in different industries uh, with different levels of maturity and so on and so forth. So the tool allows you three different mechanisms to come up with a new, with a new rule. One is just enable or disable the rest of the out-of-the-box rules that are, that are uh, available for you over uh, 50 different rules. Second one is uh, you can parameterize some of our parameters parameter shable rules that we offer. This allows you a large number of rules uh, uh, to be applied, uh, mainly based on, on uh, patterns or mainly based on information coming from models and so on and so forth. And the last resort always is uh, we also allow you the chance to, to even write your own code. So you can, uh, you can write your own code on top of Verification Studio and you can adapt uh, uh, whatever rule or you can create your own new rules just by coding in C on top of verification studio. This is the last resort. Normally, 99% uh, of the needs in terms of uh, new rules from our customers can be created with uh, either the out-of-the-box or the parameter disabled rules. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, another question is, when you first start using the tools, are there already some rules to be used, or do we have to create them? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, part of my previous answer is answering also this question. Yeah. The out of the box uh, is including, in this case, 21 uh, tools. Okay, then another question that we have is how is the dictionary stored? What is the format of the data that goes into it? Um, can it come from other sources or be linked to other sources? Uh, good. Uh, uh, this uh, third tool that I was mentioning, uh, Knowledge Manager, is the tool that we use to deal with uh, dictionaries. However, uh, especially in the latest version of our tool, we have opened the door to, be, to connect this dictionary to other external tools. So uh, most of the time, these dictionaries uh, are not something that you have to fill up, uh, uh, adding new elements one after the other. So normally, this information could be coming from models. So now you can connect the you can connect to Rhapsody, you can connect to uh, Papyrus, you can connect to Magic Draw, you can connect to other modeling tools um, to extract the information from them, or, or you can connect, for instance, uh, and retrieve the, the signal names from from um, from a modeling tool, uh, from Simulink or whatever. Right. So normally this is the this is the way, and of course, if you have your own dictionaries, you can import these dictionaries very quickly and very easily in Knowledge Manager. Knowledge Manager offers you a large number of different options for to import, and also options to connect to external tools. So if you have uh, other uh, thesaurus or ontology management tools like, like uh, such as uh, ProtoJ, we can connect uh, ProtoJ in live, let's say, uh, uh, in the same way as we can connect to to a modeling tool, a live connection to a modeling tool. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, thank you very much again to, that was that were all the questions that we had. Uh, thank you very much again to all the participants. And uh, thank you very much to the presenter, Jose, as well. Um, should you have any further question or want to have more information, please don't hesitate to contact, to contact us by email at contact at reusecompany.com or in our website, uh, www.reusecompany.com. On the other hand, during our next webinar on knowledge and quality management milestones in a systems engineering organization, the presenter will explain us about how important is knowledge and quality management as a, conti as a, a continuation from today's introduction to the quality world in general.
Uh, ambiguity is a factor that can jeopardize the optimal development of a project as decisions over the requirement statements are made subjectively. Luckily, this aspect can be under control if we apply systems engineering center on knowledge and quality to develop better assets of information within the project life cycle. And there are four main aspects that aid the implementation of KCSE or knowledge centric systems engineering within an organization which are discovering the organizational know-how in requirements documents, have a controlled information to unify requirements interpretation, being able to identify strengths and challenges in requirements documents, and performing smarter and quicker verification analysis. So the dates for this webinar are Tuesday, October the 30th at 5 p.m. CET, Central European Time, and Wednesday, October the 31st at 9 a.m. Central European Time. So thank you very much for your participation and see you on our next webinar.